he was an extraordinarily divisive character. Mr. Percival, on being shot, staggered backward and said, oh, murder, murder. And we have this shockwave reverberating through the building. The assassination did spark off a sort of panic at Westminster and beyond. Spencer Percival died, aged 49, in the lobby of the House of Commons on the 11th of May, 1812. He was shot by a bankrupt businessman, the only Prime Minister to have been assassinated, and probably the most famous politician you've never heard of. Today, Spencer Percival's life is a footnote in the history books and the manner of his death, a pub quiz question. But 200 years ago, his murder, his assassination, rocked the establishment and fed fears of revolution. These were turbulent times. Britain was at war. At war with France when Napoleon had come to power on the back of revolution. At war with slave traders. At war with factory workers, Luddites, smashing new weaving machines and inciting sedition in the north of England. And Britain was engaged in a trade war too. The United States. Spencer Percival was not just Prime Minister. He was also Chancellor of the Exchequer and Leader of the House of Commons, among several other senior government jobs. With the King, George III, declared mad, Spencer Percival embodied the British state. Of course, back then, politicians didn't have to be popular. This was the era of the rotten borough when parliamentary seats were often in the gift of a wealthy patron. Spencer Percival was the son of an earl, raised in comfortable style at Charlton House near Greenwich. A natural social conservative, he had no time for workers' rights, and he forced tough new legislation through Parliament. To be convicted of machine-breaking now was to be sentenced to death. You were either for Spencer Percival over the smashing machines or you were against him. But he was an extraordinarily divisive character and I think that is really, when one's looking at his uh, achievements, and I think they were considerable, I think that his divisiveness is the thing to hold on to. Nowadays, he might be called a conviction politician. His religious beliefs had led him to oppose slavery and Catholic emancipation, and to keep, at great expense, a British force in Portugal when Napoleon controlled much of Western Europe. His policies had also brought Britain to the brink of war with its former North American colony, and hit the traders who sent goods and slaves across the Atlantic. When he died, there was rejoicing in the streets. But the bankrupt businessman who shot Spencer Percival had his own grievances. John Bellingham had been imprisoned in Russia and felt the British authorities had done little to help. He'd suffered for six years at the Tsar's pleasure and wanted compensation. On his return to England, his wife and a friend helped him petition Whitehall and Westminster. The women all told him he was mad. Effectively, all the people he met um, told him that he was mad, that he would never get compensation. Eventually, his wife said, well, I'm leaving you unless you drop this, this plea for compensation. And the very interesting thing is that for two years, he did nothing. He went back to Liverpool, stayed with his, his wife, brought up three children, and did nothing. But the city was hard hit by the loss of American trade. And by late 1811, the family was destitute. John Bellingham left Liverpool for London, aiming to have his day in court and win £8,000 compensation from the government. He returned to his petitions. Some are kept at the National Archives. They're among a cache of material being put online for the bicentenary. We have some absolutely fascinating records here. This is a uh, petition from John Bellingham, the assassin. Um, it's dated March the 12th, so right. you know, it really is only uh, a couple of months before the assassination. To the Honourable 
the House of Commons of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland in Parliament assembled the humble petition of John Bellingham of Liverpool, merchant. This time he was doing it in a very clear, cool, rational way. It wasn't the deranged way that he was doing it in 1809. It was an entirely different thing, and he had a plan. Everything is skewed. He imagines that this is the way the world should be, and the way he imagines the world to be is that if he can just get, spent, get the government into court, then everyone will understand that he has been unjustly denied compensation. And so the way to get the government into court eventually, if they don't give him compensation earlier, is to shoot Spencer Percival. But was he acting alone? Bellingham was penniless, and yet he lived in London till the May of 1812 and spent around £90, a substantial sum. Who paid him? One theory names an American businessman based in Liverpool and trading with Russia. Elisha Peck uh, also had uh, an interest in preventing what was clearly going to happen, which was war with America, uh, because there was so much fury in the United States at the boarding of their ships, the stopping and searching of their ships by the Royal Navy, that there was this huge surge for war coming up. And so the American merchants in Liverpool had a huge need to stop the war. But Elisha Peck also had contact through Russia. But I'm so certain that within Liverpool, there was such fury and rage against Spencer Percival that he was merely a conduit for this um, real determination to get Percival out of the way. At quarter past five on the 11th of May, Spencer Percival left Downing Street, hurried across Parliament Square, and came here to the House of Commons. He rushed up the steps and into the Commons lobby, and waiting for him, was John Bellingham. It all happened very quickly. Percival entered St Stephen's lobby and Bellingham, who'd been sat waiting for him on a bench on the left, got up, put a pistol to his chest and fired. This diagram of the scene was made for Bellingham's trial. Number one is Spencer Percival having just entered the lobby and number two, John Bellingham, the assassin. We see the exact route he took from having been seated on the bench waiting mm -hmm. to moving straight over almost in front of Spencer Percival, shooting him at point blank range. And um, we then also see uh, Spencer Percival's route having been shot. He staggers backwards and then attempts to walk into the, into the House of Commons, but collapses at this spot here. So it's a very uh, vivid account of the uh, assassination. The original building burnt down in 1834 and was rebuilt as part of the new palace. And there's no formal monument to the death of Spencer Percival in Parliament, except that is for these war tiles. It's said they marked the spot where Spencer Percival died Another story goes that the tilers who laid the floor just ran out of tiles. Records from the time show how the murder was reported in Parliament. A selection of these documents form part of a commemorative display in Westminster. This is a very direct piece of evidence as to what was happening that afternoon, and it does convey this sense of panic uh, and uh, disbelief as to what had actually happened and how the authorities here were going to deal with it. Um, I think really these are notes that were made by the clerk who was in the House of Lords chamber. I was at the door of the House of Commons and I saw the pistol, I saw the fire and I saw Mr Percival fall. As word spread that the Prime Minister had been shot, crowds converged on Westminster. Was this vanguard of revolution? Enraged? Incensed? Murderous? No sooner had the news of Mr Percival's murder been received in this town than the most enthusiastic demonstrations of joy of the most horrible description were invinced. That public mood was reflected in poison pen letters sent to Lord Leveson Gower, who'd been British ambassador to St Petersburg at the time of Bellingham's imprisonment. They're kept at the National Archives. 
Britain's got a long tradition of kind of, you know, mob, various episodes with mobs, should we say, and uh, you can see the fears reflected in some of these letters talking about the lower classes seething, you know, with, uh, with rage and um, uh, there's um, one particular letter where the author is horrified by rejoicing in the streets at the news of, of Spencer Percival's assassination. Revolution never came, but that fear of insurrection might explain the speed of what happened next. John Bellingham was taken to Newgate Prison, and within a matter of days stood trial at the Old Bailey. His defence team hoped to prove he was mad, but they had little time, and Bellingham's fluent and erudite performance in the witness box undermined them. His day in court lasted just seven hours. He was found guilty and executed on May the 18th, just one week after the assassination. This act details how Parliament voted through substantial compensation for Spencer Percival's widow and her 11 children, including a lump sum of £50,000, a huge amount of money in those days. This church in Ealing, on the site of the old Percival family home, was paid for by his daughter Frederica. All Saints held its own commemorative festival with a curious title. He comes across as um, someone who's quite forgotten despite his uh, significant contribution to public life in England and also his uh, remarkable death. So the Right Honourable Watts's name was a sort of tongue-in-cheek way of saying this is the Prime Minister that we have forgotten but now is the time to remember what he did. This remarkable death mask was bequeathed by the family. The death mask was actually made on the day of his death by Joseph Nollikins, who was probably the most famous sculptor of that day. And it, it is thought to be the only surviving death mask. Spencer Percival was buried in the family vault at St Luke's Church in Charlton, South East London. The final resting place for the Right Honourable What's-His-Name. You'd have thought the manner of his death would have secured his place in history but it seems posterity has forgotten both the assassin and the victim. <laughs>